Hi, my name is Dana Scheider, and in this video I'm going to explain the basics of the International Phonetic Alphabet. If you're a young singing student and are just starting to explore singing in other languages, you may have heard of the IPA or worked with it to a limited degree. Nonetheless, I know a lot of my students find the idea of the IPA a little complicated, so hopefully I can shed some light here. I'm not going to be discussing specific IPA symbols or transcriptions in this video, but I am planning to make other videos that will deal with that, so if you're interested, please subscribe to my channel and you'll definitely be updated when those come up. I also do apologize that this video is going to be visually a little odd, but I don't have a high quality video recorder, so I'm just doing what I can with still images and recorded voice. Hopefully the video will still be a helpful visual aid. Anyway, I'm going to start by explaining what the IPA is, and then go into a little more depth about the kinds of pronunciation issues it addresses. Alright, as I mentioned, IPA is the abbreviation for the International Phonetic Alphabet. The IPA was created by a group of French linguists who needed a way to describe the pronunciation of foreign languages. That's important because between any two languages, each one is going to have some sounds that the other doesn't have. For example, English doesn't have nasal vowels like the French a, while French doesn't have an a sound like in bat. The IPA is a set of symbols that can be used to indicate pronunciation of foreign languages. Classical singers will most often see the IPA used to show pronunciation of Italian, Latin, French, German, Russian, and occasionally Spanish or other languages. If you do research on the IPA, you'll find out that the version singers use is simplified compared to the very complete IPA that these French linguists developed. Since we as singers usually only use the IPA for a pretty limited number of languages, it's easier for us to just learn the conventions of those languages than to commit literally thousands of IPA symbols to memory. When you see the IPA written, it'll be in brackets or between two slashes, as I'm showing on the screen here. We do this to distinguish the IPA from regular text, because a lot of the IPA symbols are going to look like letters of the alphabet, but they aren't necessarily pronounced like the letters they look like. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about what the IPA symbols mean, what kinds of IPA symbols there are, and what problems they help us solve in terms of knowing how a foreign language is pronounced. The three main things that IPA symbols can help us figure out are vowel and consonant sounds, agogic accent, and vowel and consonant length, and I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those things. I'm going to start with vowel and consonant sounds. Most IPA symbols are the letter-like symbols that are used to spell out the actual sounds of a language. The IPA has symbols for both vowel sounds and consonant sounds. The way linguists define these terms is pretty complicated, so I'm just going to say that a vowel sound for our purposes is a sound made without obstructing the flow of air from your lungs as it goes up your windpipe and out your mouth. I'm going to take another stretch here that would probably make linguists cringe and define a consonant as any sound that's not a vowel. In English, any sound spelled with A, E, I, O, or U will pretty much always be a vowel. There are three kinds of vowel sounds that the IPA can represent. The first is called monophthongs, which is a fancy word for a single vowel sound. Monophthongs are usually just referred to as vowels or as pure vowels. We actually don't have too many of these in English, but one example would be the e eh in the word yet, which I'm spelling out in the IPA on the screen here. You can see how one IPA symbol stands for the monophthong e. Eh. The second kind of vowel sound is a diphthong, which is a combination of two vowel sounds right next to each other. A great example of this in English is the word I, which is a combination of a ah and i. Most of our vowel sounds in English are actually diphthongs, but that's another story for another day. Finally, we have triphthongs, vowel sounds made up of three vowels right next to each other. A great example of this in English, um, and I'm going to use the received pronunciation for this, which is standard British English because it makes it an easier example, is the word hia. It's made up of the sounds in I, as well as kind of an a uh sound, also called a schwa, on the end. There are numerous types of consonants in addition to these vowel sounds, but I'm only addressing vowels here because pure vowels versus diphthongs versus triphthongs don't tend to get covered all that much elsewhere. I'll go into consonants more in another video. While we're talking about what these letter-like IPA symbols stand for, I should make it clear that I'm talking about vowel sounds and consonant sounds, not vowel and consonant letters, which can have all kinds of different sounds associated with them. 
For example, the English vowel letter A can stand for the sounds A, 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 and A, among others. Each of those sounds has its own IPA symbol, and one of them is a diphthong rather than a pure vowel. One other important thing I wanted to add here is that the sound an IPA symbol denotes is not necessarily the sound that you as an English speaker would most intuitively associate with that symbol. A great example is this little guy here, pronounced y as in yet. I'm mentioning this to just highlight that it's really important to memorize your IPA symbols and not just assume they mean what they look like, because a lot of the time they really don't. In a similar vein, I should also point out that although each symbol will stand for a similar sound in every language, each language kind of has its own version of sounds. For example, the IPA open E is used in the English word yet and in the Italian word bello, but you can hear that those are not actually identical vowels. In addition to vowel and consonant sounds, the IPA can also show a gogic accent. A gogic accent is just a way of describing the phenomenon that if a word has multiple syllables, usually one will be stressed more than the others. The stress is usually in the form of that syllable being pronounced either slightly louder or longer than the other syllables. The IPA shows a gogic accent by putting what looks like an apostrophe before the accented syllable. Sometimes the syllables will be separated by a space in the IPA transcription, but other times the person who wrote the transcription just expects you to know where the syllable breaks are. And that's not necessarily as hard as it sounds. Here are the transcriptions for the Italian word pena, one with spaces, one without. Notice that the stress is on the first syllable, pena, and you know that because of the apostrophe before the first syllable. Finally, the IPA can indicate how long you should hold a vowel or consonant sound. This concept can be a little strange for English speakers since vowel and consonant length aren't very prominent features of our language, but it can be really important in other languages. Like in Italian, consonant length is sometimes the only difference between two different words. The IPA shows length by using a symbol that looks a little like a colon. This tells you to hold the sound before the colon longer. When this is used with consonants, it's common for the consonant symbol to be written twice, with the colon in between. Vowels are never doubled in the IPA. I'll give an example of this concept using Italian consonants. The words pena and penna are pronounced exactly the same, except that pena has one N, a short N sound, and penna has two Ns a long N sound. That little change totally changes the meaning of the word from pena, meaning pain, to penna, meaning either feather or pen, depending on the context. So, to summarize, the International Phonetic Alphabet is a set of symbols, many of which look like letters, that are used to indicate the pronunciation of words in foreign languages. Since singers often sing in other languages, this is something we use constantly. IPA symbols can indicate agogic stress in a word, pronunciation of both vowels and consonants in a foreign language, and how long those vowel and consonant sounds should be held. I hope you found this video informative, and I'm looking forward to making more, so if this was helpful for you, please subscribe to my channel. See you next time.